This meeting is being recorded. All right. Well, thank you, Derek, and thank you, Kelly, as well, for organizing this meeting. Well, Venerable Chanda is uh, taking some, finally, some uh, uh, retreat time for herself. I know she's been uh, very dedicated to uh, all of the community here, and it's lovely to meet you online. Hopefully, uh, soon in the near future, I'm going to be able to meet you in person. Um, so even though I live in America, I am originally from Italy, born and bred. So if I make mistakes, it's not that uh, I'm illiterate, but actually English is my second language. So bear with me and uh, feel free to ask um, any questions um, to clarify anything that I'm saying. Um, and so I apologize in advance for my broken English. <laughs> All right, well, uh, maybe we can start with uh, straight with some meditation practice um, and we can get in a comfortable position. If we're not in a comfortable position already, a seated position, either on the floor or in a chair. I'm taking a few minutes to settle down and when we're ready, we can Close our eyes and take a few deep breaths. Relaxing the entire body. From the top of the head to the tip of the toes. Relaxing the forehead, the face, the jaw. Relaxing the throat, the shoulders. the arms, the belly. Relaxing the legs and feet. Relaxing the entire body. We can gently lift our attention to the breath, perhaps anchoring it if it helps to the tip of the nose, or keeping a wider angle. We can start observing deeply every in-breath and out-breath.
fully aware if each breath is short or long, if it's shallow or deep. doesn't matter what it's like. What's important is that we know what it's like. If the mind gets distracted or starts wandering off, we can gently bring it back to the breath without reprimanding ourselves, but instead treasuring that moment of wisdom, that moment of mindfulness. And we keep watching the breath like it was the most important thing in the world.
And the more we keep bringing and holding our attention to the breath, the more the mind becomes filled. And the more the mind becomes still, the more the mind becomes peaceful. And the more the mind becomes peaceful, the more the mind becomes happy. So we can recollect how this happiness is always accessible to us. If only we put the right conditions in place. So we can wish for ourselves to always be happy. Always be peaceful. Always be safe. May I be happy. May I be healthy. May I be safe. May I be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May I be free from greed, hatred, and illusion. And we can extend this wish to all our friends practicing with us tonight, in the room with us, or in the screen that we're sharing. May we be happy. May we all be healthy. May we all be safe. May we all be free from suffering. and the causes of suffering. Maybe be free from greed, hatred, and delusion.
May we all be happy and peaceful. And we can keep nurturing this metta, loving kindness in our hearts, imbuing our minds with metta, loving friendliness for ourselves, our friends, and expanding it to all sentient beings in all directions, human and non-human. Why would we wish for anyone to be anything other than happy? May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be safe. May all beings be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. May all beings be free from greed, hatred, and delusion. May all beings attain blissful, supreme Nibbana. For the benefit of themselves and others. May all beings be unconditionally happy. And we can hold in our hearts for a few more moments this beautiful metta, loving kindness. And without letting it go, we can start slowly coming out of meditation and opening our eyes. All right. So at this time you can stretch a little bit if it helps.
And at this moment, I'll share some words of Dhamma on, um, well, the theme for today is the fourfold assembly. Uh, so before starting, we can uh, all pay homage uh, to the Buddha, our original teacher, the reason why we're all gathered here today. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma Sambhutasam Uttam Tamam Sangham Namasami So one of the things that we do whenever we um, essentially become Buddhists uh, is um, we take refuge in Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and um, we don't take it once, we take it multiple times over and over again, and we recollect also the qualities of Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha so that it's fresh in the, in the mind. Um, the purpose of our spiritual practice, uh, the beauty, also of uh, what we define as the triple gem. Uh, so the amazing characteristics and qualities uh, of the mind of the Buddha uh, that he has developed uh, through his own will. And also obviously the incredible qualities of the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha, that whether or not a Buddha whether it's Shakyamuni Buddha or Buddhas before him or Buddhas after him, uh, will come to this world. Um, the Dhamma, so the truth, will still exist, is still there, and it invites us to come and see for ourselves, and it's timeless. So the incredible qualities of, of the Dhamma. And then we also take refuge in the Sangha. But what does exactly the Sangha mean. It's quite interesting. I, I think that there's uh, tonight uh, quite a few convert Buddhists. I am one myself. And uh, probably there's also uh, people who instead have been born Buddhist. And usually uh, we interact, uh, hopefully we interact with one another uh, so we can help each other on the path. But definitely here at Empty Cloud Monastery, we have quite an international community um, and people come from all sorts of different places, different continents. We usually have, I think, almost every single continent represented <laughs> since the very beginning. Uh, so Buddhists, non-Buddhists, uh, all the different age ranges. And um, But usually there is a bit of uh, when we come to this path, when we enter this path, there is usually, you know, um, kind of um, idea of what the Sangha is, uh, or we pick it up from our peers who tend to have similar experiences from us. Um, and usually, you know, in, uh, if one has had some sort of experience or practice in uh, sort of more secular Buddhist, as we call it here in the, in the United States, a secular Buddhist environment, uh, so perhaps they've entered this path through meditation practice. Usually the, the term Sangha uh, is used to refer um, as a generic term for a group of people um, who comes together and it's usually lay and they don't have weird outfits and shaved heads <laughs> like myself. Um, and that is what is normally called as a Sangha. And I remember that even though I actually started my practice in um, traditional Asian monasteries, at a certain point, I was quite unclear with uh, how this term was, um, or I didn't actually know that this term could be even controversial. But anyway, I was running already Buddhist Insights, uh, the nonprofit organization, and I invited an Indonesian Buddhist friend 
uh, together with other friends. And I said, dear Sangha, uh, you're welcome to come to, you know, the um, this place, this monastery, etc. Um, and at this event, da da da. And uh, Luciana, my Indonesian friend, re replied, oh, I didn't know that I was an ordained monastic. <laughs> and in that moment, it occurred to me, I was like, oh, how interesting. Actually, back then I was not ordained. So I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not the Sangha, according to Luciana, and she's not the Sangha either. So what exactly uh, is the Sangha? So usually in traditional Buddhist environments, um, Asian temples, uh, the Sangha is a term that is, is used in relation to people with robes. Uh, but sometimes you can also hear, listen to some monastics. Um, a while back, I, I was um, actually reading a book from a very, mm, very educated, uh, very learned uh, bhikkhu uh, from Malaysia. At a certain point, actually, in this book, he said how the Sangha actually um, when one was taking refuge in the Sangha, since the time of the Buddha, one was only taking refuge in the Sangha of Bhikkhus, which I thought was very interesting. Like, oh, <laughs> now not only, you know, uh, I thought I had joined the Sangha because I was a Bhikkhuni. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, maybe actually I'm still not part of the Sangha even though <laughs> I put robes on. Um, so it's this journey of investigation, right? So is the Sangha, the Sangha of Bhikkhus, is it the Sangha of ordained uh, Bhikkhus and Bhikkhunis? Is it the Sangha of um, whether it's ordained people or not ordained people or, or also generic group of people <laughs> that, that are practicing the Buddhist teachings or even just practicing meditation? What is actually the Sangha? Well, in my research, uh, I'm very passionate of um, the, the suttas. So in my research, I've come to the understanding that, well, definitely the definition that we have in secular Buddhist circles um, is incorrect. It's definitely not the, the way that Sangha, the term Sangha is used. It's never used for uh, only lay people. And definitely also uh, my understanding that it refers only to the Bhikkhu Sangha is also wrong. I happen to come from a country, an Indo-European country, Italy, uh, that uh, where Latin um, is very much related to Pali, uh, which is why I was able to actually translate the Terigata last year, and I'm um, translating more suttas from Pali to English and Pali to Italian. Uh, and discovering how actually even Buddhism and even, you know, the the language um, of India is not necessarily that far away as we might think from, from where we come from. Um, so it's very similar etymology, very similar um, uh, grammatical structure. And there's also something called the generic masculine <laughs> that I'm very familiar with um, in, uh, in Italian that it's a little bit different in uh, in English, uh, where we use, um, you know, to refer to groups of people that that even have, you know, can be a group of females, and then there is one male. Then automatically we default to the masculine. Or if I have, for example, I have two brothers, we wouldn't say there's no word in Italian to say siblings. I would say we are brothers. My brother and I, we are brothers. We're both brothers. Um, so the language, interestingly enough, even though growing up in Italy, I never felt erased. Um, it is quite interesting how sometimes instead when we read the suttas and they are translated in English, there can be that uh, sense that people who have a particular type of body are somewhat erased. And sometimes even, uh, you know, <laughs> there can be the confusion of, uh, once again, having either suttas spoken to a group of ordained monastics and then one part of the uh, particular part of the monastic sangha being erased. And that's a problem of the translation, actually, I, I've come to realize, rather than 
um, a problem of the text itself um, and a problem of language. And it's actually quite interesting how we're having these conversations worldwide, um, it seems, um, also about trying to address uh, the problematics actually that can come when especially also we're translating texts or we're going from one country to another. So once again, I never had that problem uh, in uh, <laughs> growing up in Italy, but then it kind of got lost in translation, right? <laughs> I still remember, I think I was, uh, I was actually talking in English and I said, you know, I, we are brothers and someone was very confused that I said <laughs> that I was referring myself as one of the brothers. But anyway, uh, besides the point, getting back to early Buddhism and how uh, the term Sangha is used, I think it's important to see that aside from the gender the, per se, it's also used in two ways. Uh, so it's usually used to refer to the Samuti Sangha, so the Sangha of ordained monastics. So someone who enters. Um, Mm, the yeah the ordained um, sangha of bhikkhus or bhikkhunis just without necessarily having any type of uh, level of um, accomplishment uh, without having entered the stream and then of course there is the arya sangha the noble disciples of the buddha um, so from the stream enter all the way to uh, the arahant of course and so when we enter when we become the Arya Sangha, then there is no going back. There's no backsliding. So we should all aim at stream entry. Forget about enlightenment. Let's all aim at stream entry. <laughs> Much more feasible. If we think enlightenment, you know, complete erasure of greed, hatred, and delusion, that seems, sounds very, very difficult and out of reach. But when we think about what it actually entails to, um, uh, to enter the stream, that's like a lot more feasible. We can do that. Maybe erasing a little bit the self, <laughs> that's the hardest part. But it's, you know, having a realization of oneself is definitely much easier than eliminating it altogether, right? Getting ourselves out of the, out of the way. Um, so yeah, the Arya Sangha, of course, is actually the one that we are taking refuge. You know, when we're chanting the Iti Piso, for example, we're taking refuge in the Arya Sangha. And the Arya Sangha does not only have contained only people in robes, but actually contains um, the fourfold Sangha, the fourfold Arya Sangha. And it's actually also the fourfold Arya Sangha, the fourfold Arya Chatu Parisa, so the fourfold noble, assemb uh, noble assembly. Um, so it's bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, um, and laymen and laywomen, uh, traditionally, but we can also include uh, our transgender friends. Uh, so we can also have uh, every, everyone who doesn't necessarily identify with, uh, with the binary, so to speak. But traditionally, we would talk about the, the fourfold sangha. Um, and when we're talking, though, about people who are not accomplished, usually we, it's obviously, actually, even when we talk about people who are accomplished, uh, whether it's uh, monastics or lay people, usually um, they don't come with, uh, with business cards that say Arahant or <laughs> stream enter. Uh, actually, I would encourage all of you to be very diffident to, for anyone who goes around with uh, <laughs> business cards who, who claim such accomplishments. You know, another incredible quality of an awakened mind or a mind that is well developed is humbleness. So usually they don't go and um, highlight it here and there, or rather there is this, well, monastics also have certain precepts not to disclose it, so not to create unbalances uh, with other monastics, and also not to, you know, kind of, um, also to create the conditions so that we don't overestimate our accomplishments, and actually we nurture a bit of a doubtful mind, right, uh, where we are constantly questioning whether or not we are awakened rather than taking that for granted. And these are all incredible good things. So this um, also has created though the conditions for then um, people to identify the monastic Sangha as 
um, sort of the icon of the emblem in traditional Asian countries as the emblem for the Aryasanga. So we're kind of the mascot. We are the emblem <laughs> of what it means uh, to, to practice awakening. Um, it's actually very humbling to, to wear these robes. Um, also quite shocking, you know, when you ordain, uh, if you're not, at least that was my experience, uh, since I always call it the small print, you know, I thought I was going to ordain and just meditate, but in reality, there's a whole other <laughs> uh, experience that is never shared uh, with candidates before they <laughs> ordain as monastics, which is also how other people relate to the sign of the Samana. Uh, we were just recently in Colombia, we were invited at a conference there in Bogota. Um, and people, even though they were not necessarily familiar with Buddhist monastics, um, there was this incredible, um, I guess, aura, not of each one of us per se as individuals, but rather at what this um, these robes, what these signs, these marks, the, the mark of the contemplative just means for so many people at large. And so people would come and flock at us and uh, ask us all so, so many different questions and were in awe at hearing how we were practicing the teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha has always a great reputation. Even when people don't know too much about Buddhism, they're always happy for the most part to hear that someone is practicing the teachings of the Buddha. So yeah, very humbling, very interesting. And one also though understands why then um, this robe is worthy of respect and why our actions when we become ordained don't reflect any more on ourselves, but actually reflect on the teachings of the Buddha at large and how we, even though perhaps we're not a shining jewel, we're not the shining third jewel, we do represent the jewel. And this is important to understand whether we're monastics or lay people in this path and figure out and if we're converts, um, truly understand also why there is such a strong tradition usually in um, Asian communities to, to use such an important word like the Sangha um, in reference only to, to the monastic Sangha, to the ordained monastic Sangha. But the term Parisa, so Chatu Parisa, there's also actually a beautiful foundation, the Chatu Parisa Foundation um, in, uh, in, in Asia that is um, actually instrumental for the um, ordination and uh, the training of a lot of bhikkhunis uh, back in uh, uh, India in Thailand, um, actually even in Alaska, they have a center in Alaska <laughs> here in the United States. Um, uh, well, of course, in Sri Lanka, but also in all, all different places, um, both in the West and in the East. But it's an Asian organization, um, and it was founded, in fact, with the mission to reestablish the fourfold assembly. And the term that is used is the Chatu Parisa, which is this, exactly the same term that is used within uh, the Pali Canon to refer to the assembly of bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, laymen, and laywomen who can be both awakened or unawakened. And in fact, there is actually uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya in, an entire vaga uh, called the Parisavaga that outlines, you know, both the good and bad qualities that both monastics and lay people might take on as individuals and as a whole, <laughs> affecting each other, uh, and that basically result in polluting or in embellishing, in adorning the assembly. In the Sobhana Sutta, in fact, um, actually there's a, quite a few lists on how that, uh, that comes into being, uh, but actually it's also in the Sobhana Sutta, um, also in the Yangutra Nikaya, it's, it's worth mentioning that actually here, uh, the term Sangha is also referred as a synonym of the Chatu Parisa. But since the Buddha speaks about actually only the noble qualities in the Sobhana Sutta, in fact, it means the term Sobhana means adorned, uh, we can see that he's talking once again about the Arya Sangha, not about just any, anyone who is um, sort of practicing is on the path, but rather someone who is um, either fully developed or developed to a point that they will not backslide. 
And so, uh, once again, in the Sobra Sutta, the Buddha talks about the four kinds of people uh, who are during the Sangha, bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, laymen and laywomen, and who he call, he says who, how they are competent in Panya. Um, so they have uh, with the wisdom, they have accomplished the wisdom of an appropriate response. They're also disciplined, so they are restrained in body, speech, and mind. They're self-confident uh, with that courage that stems from the faith, the moral virtue, and the practice of Dhamma. And they're learned, so they are aware, they know um, both intellectually and experientially Dhamma Vinaya. And they're experts of the Dhamma, so they're skillful in teaching and um, both monastics, other monastics, and lay people. Um, there is also another sutta where the Buddha is asked why he shares the Dhamma in different ways to people, even though he's full of compassion. He's asked this question um, in the Ketu Pama Sutta, uh, not by one of his followers, but actually um, someone from another sect. And the Buddha says that he prioritizes um, bhikkhus and bhikkhunis first, and then goes to the lay followers, and then he will speak to other wanderers from other set, uh, from other sects, or um, yeah, from different affiliations that are not already established in the Dhamma, uh, for their sake, so out of compassion. But he compares the monastics to planting seeds in a good field, or like. Uh, storing water in a jar that is uncracked and unporous. And then he compares um, the lay people, his actual followers, to an average field um, or to storing water in an uncracked but porous jar. And then he compares um, the rest of the people that are not already established in, in Dhamma um, to a poor field or to a jar that is cracked and porous. And essentially he asks uh, the, the wanderer, um, like, what would he do? What, where would he plant the seed first? Would he plant it in the like really fertile soil or in the moderate, moderate soil first or in the sort of kind of poor soil, poor field first? And similarly, where would he store the, the water? <laughs> in the perfect sort of canister or in the one that it's, um, pretty good or, or in the one that seeps everything through. And he says that um, the last one, of course, he might or he might not <laughs> store the water. And so sometimes if we read these, um, these suttas, we can get a little bit on the competitive side, whether we are um, you know, ordained or not ordained. Maybe if we are ordained, we're, we, we start having a conceit of superiority and going like, hmm, yes, I am so much better than the, the lay people. <laughs> And uh, let's not even go to the other uh, people who are not established in the in the Buddhist teachings, right? Um, or if we are lay people, we can go like, oh well, <laughs> actually I'm a much better practitioner than that monastic over there. Look at that; they don't even know, <laughs> um, you know, the teachings of the Buddha that well or at all, or they do they even understand it, um, right? And we're kind of like missing the point. This is not um, a way that is skillful to, to approach these teachings, but rather um, it's important to understand why the Buddha is saying the things that he's saying and why he's established a monastic order and why he um, is teaching lay people. And we see throughout the canon that actually he has incredible um, followers, both monastic and lay, that are accomplished in the path, but that, of course, the monastic um, sort of training is the one that um, he has designed and crafted in order to um, create the conditions to make as much faster as possible progress in the path, right? So it's to be praised uh, when, whenever a monastic, whether they're accomplished or not, they follow, for example, the Vinaya, they follow the Patimokkha, and they are restrained by the Patimokkha, the Buddha says. They see, start seeing danger and minor faults. I remember the first time I went to Santa Chittarama, that is uh, my first 
a monastery that I went to in this life. And it's a Thai forest um, monastery right outside Rome in Italy, in the tradition of Ajahn Chah. And I was like, very new to Buddhism. I think I only knew a few things about the Dalai Lama, but I hadn't even read a, a book of, about the Dalai Lama. Um, and that was my first interaction with, with monastics. And I was just so impressed by their conduct. I was so impressed by how they were practicing the Vinaya and the genius actually of the Buddha in creating these, these rules that um, by essentially um, keeping to those limitations uh, by not cultivating, for example, the, the land, by not uh, cooking for themselves, so then they were mm, in automatic in contact with lay people. And I was like, wow, these people would have never, you know, I would have never been able to be in touch with them. They would probably be hermits if only, <laughs> you know, if they had the, the ability to provide for themselves. And in fact, it's actually quite um, interesting how even though I grew up in, in Italy, the land of Catholicism and <laughs> the land of the Vatican, I met Buddhist monastics first, then I met Christian monastics. <laughs> met many priests, hundreds, millions probably of priests. We have like one every corner. <laughs> but I never actually met a monastic. And that's because usually monastics in the Catholic tradition, at least when I was living in Italy, um, are pretty independent from lay people. So anyway, we see that how um, the Patimaka, whether we are relating to it as lay people, so when I was before, uh, or when I am now practicing the Patimaka, um, how important, how transformative it is to the mind and how important it is to preserve it for the benefit of the people who, um, who practice it, of course, and also for others who can benefit um, from being inspired also by role models. And also, obviously, thinking about it in terms of past lives as well, also understanding how someone who um, has uh, reached that level of dispassion um, towards sensuality um, and embraces renunciation so much, has been practicing for so long, has really good karmic conditions, I would say. Um, so the level of commitment, obviously, of a monastic is 100%, which is why the, the Buddha says that, um, you know, it's a fertile soil. Usually if someone ordains, <laughs> that's the, the center of their their life, their, their sole objective. Um, this is not, once again, to say that someone uh, who has not taken monastic vows cannot accomplish, make accomplishments or progress towards the path. And in fact, in the suttas, we have numerous um, beautiful uh, examples of accomplished householders, both ma male and female. But each one of them, I have to say, especially there's this sutta actually of Uga, the householder, that I remember uh, when I first read it, it delighted my mind. Actually, it still does whenever I read it. And uh, he's um, um, a once returner, if I remember correctly. And uh, he's, uh, he encounters, um, I think, the Buddha. And he starts saying how he has these wonderful qualities of mind. <laughs> he's very proud. Um, and, um, and he's not arrogant about it, quite the opposite. But in his incredible list of qualities of mind, one of them that I found extremely uh, beautiful was um, that even though he had the capability of reading people's minds and actually that the devas even would come and um, tell him whether a monastic was accomplished or not accomplished in the past. He was like, even though um, I can see that, I will feed each one of them. I will give the same offering of food to each one of them equally. And then the second thing was, even though um, he was, you know, once returner, actually, sorry, a non-returner, uh, that if he would meet a monastic, he would wait for the monastic to give him a Dhamma talk. And then if the monastic didn't give him a Dhamma talk, then he would give him a Dhamma talk out of compassion. How beautiful is that, right? <laughs> uh, even though someone is um, 
so realized, right? Perhaps not a fully enlightened being, but right, very close to it. Has that humbleness of mind of realizing the importance of the monastic Sangha and actually respecting someone who is uh, probably not, has not even entered the path to begin with, but sees the value of what the Buddha has put in place. And so I think we can all, whether we're monastic or lay people, learn from Oga <laughs> and um, use this also, these teachings, as um, a vehicle way of understanding how and why the Sangha is important today and also why it's important to, to use the proper terminology. When to adopt the proper terminology and also how to respect this tradition uh, that has been handed down to us by for 2,500 years by uh, both monastics and lay people. Um, and this helps, um, obviously, helps us understand uh, the, the teachings of the Buddha better, uh, prevents the delusion of the Dhamma, uh, makes us understand the purpose of the path, and also makes us respect and understand the training that the Buddha has placed has put in place for us. Um, he actually talks about the training as one of the numerous times throughout the canon, the Buddha talks about the training, respect for the training as a condition for non-decline. This is why a mind like the mind of Uga, one of the great qualities of the mind of Uga is understanding, is having this respect for, for the training. And in this context, we can also see once again how it's important to have bhikkhuni ordination. I know you're, I'm speaking to the choir because you're all here for Anukampa bhikkhuni project, um, but it's important to also reflect um, on it, not only for our own personal reasons why we think it's good and sometimes it can be you know simply well because the buddha established it but i don't know <laughs> or because i don't know i believe in gender equality these are all like good things but why is it important we want to actually have the same appreciation that uga has for ordination not just a common appreciation but a very um you know enlightened appreciation of ordination, whether it's bhikkhu or bhikkhuni ordination. Um, it's also important then to understand why in fact the Buddha did not want to pass away, did not want to attain parinibbana before having an Arya Sangha of both bhikkhus, bhikkhunis, laymen and lay women, right? Why is that so? It was he like, okay, well, you know, I've got enlightened bhikkhus and um, enlightened lay women, that's all right, okay. <laughs> it doesn't really matter <laughs> uh, whether someone is ordained or not ordained. Um, the important thing is that they're just enlightened and that's all, I can go, right? That's not the approach that the Buddha has. He's actually quite adamant in wanting to have the fourfold assembly to be an Arya Sangha. And also lastly, also why it's very harmful actually to de-emphasize full ordination or equate it to um, a practice of a lay person. A uh, lot of times I hear, you know, that it's, we don't really need um, these robes, that we don't really need uh, all these precepts, that there are many accomplished lay people. And we have, in fact, incredible stories also of Mechis in Thailand who um, have attained, um, you know, have made a lot of progress in the path. Some are reputed to be awakened, etc. That is not the point. Those are not bhikkhudis. And that's a very uh, small um, part of the whole you know, there's definitely a lot less, less, lot less uh, Meichis that are accomplished in the path than there are um, bhikkhus, for example, right? Why is that so? It's not that uh, they're inherently deficient. It's not that a, a body impedes us in the path, but rather precepts help us along the path. 
And also, just as the Buddha, you know, um, shares the teachings to the Bhikkhu and Bhikkhu Nisanga first, because it perceives it as a fertile soil, so do their disciples, his disciples. So the, do the disciples of the Buddha. So if we deprive women from ordination, then it will be very difficult for women to also have access to more profound teachings. So there's lots of different implications. The commitment is also read in a very different way. And so then it's important to also understand that the bhikkhuni sangha or the bhikkhuni ordination is not just to have a simply you know, a bunch of women in the clergy of Thailand or the clergy of Burma or the clergy of I don't know what place, <laughs> but rather it's important so we have more enlightened beings in the world, which is a win-win situation, win-win <laughs> for everyone. I would not understand why, you know, we would want for anyone not to um, have greed, hatred, and delusion. <laughs> or to have more obstacles in order to liberate the mind or not to have an easier path. And it's an easier path. I mean, it's, it might seem for some people harder, but actually <laughs> it's significantly easier to have uh, the protection of the Patimokkha to guide us along the path. So anyway, these are just a few reflections uh, on the... <laughs> on this topic, so I hope it was, um, well, it made sense. <laughs> and um, maybe we can now open it up. If you have any questions or comments, you're all free to disagree, and I won't take offense. <laughs> You can also ask off-topic questions, like why do you shave your head? That's totally okay. If anybody would like to ask a question, you can raise your, your virtual hand by clicking on the raise hand button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Or also you can just wave a bit at the screen and we'll see if we can see you and I mute you. I see Terry has a question. I will ask Terry to unmute. Um, this sort of a comment. Um, a close friend, a Thai uh, lady who was a close friend, entered the monastic life. Uh, she herself had come from a very poor background and she talk, talked about the absolutely overwhelming sense of humbled of the offerings of the morning arms round that uh, she was being offered food by people from a very poor community and it was just a sense of being part of the recognized part of Buddha teachings, that it allowed the lay community to show, I don't know, a respect, regard, a, a sense of commitment. It was um, really quite revealing. And she was quite taken aback by the depth of her own reaction to that's the the arms round yeah thank you terry for your reflections yes it definitely reminds me of when i first ordained one of the biggest issues that i had um as a monastic as a novice actually as a samaneri was um precisely to be on the receiving end uh, this is very common for women uh, because usually we're socialized at least 
in most of the world. Uh, in America, sometimes it can be a little bit different. There can be a bit of a different socialization, but definitely in Italy, we're a bit of an old school <laughs> country. Um, and definitely I've seen it in uh, my Asian sisters as well. We are very conditioned to serve. So there is some beautiful forms within the monastic um, etiquette and monastic training where we are a service within the within the sangha we kind of like have no problem you know nisaya for example uh, taking care of the elders or the preceptor etc comes really naturally as opposed to a lot of bhikkhus definitely in the in the west anyway struggle with it so much <laughs> here empty cloud it's a gender inclusive monastery so we have bhikkhus and bhikkhunis so i I tend to see these sort of um, tendencies based on, on gender. They're very amusing and interesting. Um, so yeah, the biggest struggle that the average man would will have when they put robes is that they have to take care all of a sudden. Sometimes, you know, um, will have to take care of people who are significantly younger than them. If they, uh, maybe they might be 50 years old and they have to be the assistant of a 30 year old Biku <laughs> who's perfectly like capable of doing everything, but that's just, you know, the, the nature of monastic life to humble the mind and be of service. Um, but they feel they are totally fine in receiving offerings, like no problem whatsoever. And um, for female monastics, on the other hand, we tend to struggle with, uh, with the latter rather than the former. The former, we're like, oh, yes, yes, of course, yes, Aya or Bante, yes, please, may I be of service. Um, but then as soon as something is offered to us and we don't have a material thing to give back, uh, especially to lay people, it can be mortifying. I remember I was, I wanted to disappear. I almost wanted to disrobe, actually. <laughs> it was like a, I don't want to be here receiving um, this. What have I done? What can I do to, to repay back? So that's, um, it's humbling. Uh, and it's a practice of also wisdom, of understanding that actually people are not offering to us as individuals. They're not offering to Ayasoma, but rather they're offering to the Buddha and the Sangha that, um, once again, what we were saying earlier, that we represent the Maha Sangha, we represent the Arya Sangha, we represent one of the three jewels. Um, and so usually the average person that is born in a Buddhist country will understand how meritorious it is to support the Sangha. Um, not necessarily because of the individual, but rather because of what the individual signifies and how that creates a living tradition that then uh, enables us to, to spread the Dhamma worldwide. So once we then fully understand experientially, um, our role in this equation, uh, the humbleness becomes a different type of humbleness, not an individual humbleness, but um, a more like, wow, what an amazing um, thing that I'm also, uh, you know, becoming an active agent of, of bringing forward. Um, out of compassion for others. So you understand that the appropriate response, for example, when people are giving you offerings is not thank you. I remember once I said thank you to this, uh, you know, Thai friend who put something in my bowl and they looked at me like, weird, prafarang. <laughs> what is she saying? Prafarang means foreign monk. <laughs> I mean, they didn't say that, but that was, I know they're, <laughs> I understood the look. <laughs> And then I understood that the appropriate response is sad because once again, they're not offering to me, they're offering to the Sangha. So the appropriate response is Anumodana, Anumodana Sadhu. You rejoice in their goodness. You rejoice in the good action. Um, so that's how the Sangha then is a field of merit and how we start erasing our sense of self. We start erasing our Atta. This is me, me, me. They're giving it to me, to Ayasoma. Um, and also we understand that, as the Buddha says, uh, you know, we should not be the hairs of his Dhamma. Uh, sorry, not his, the hairs of his material goods, but the hairs of his Dhamma. And that the only way that we can actually repay ever lay people of their incredible offerings is by attaining awakening. So by really putting effort in the practice, not by giving anything material. And that's another powerful um, 
training that comes within monastic life, within uh, following the Patimaka. So I don't know if I addressed your, <laughs> your comment properly. Um, so you're welcome to follow up in case. But maybe in the meanwhile, we can go to do this. Um, there. Hand up. Can do this to unmute. And I think she needs to be unmuted. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Alisoma. I am um, brand new to the, uh, the, the practice. And uh, first, I want to say I'm American and I had no difficulty understanding you. In fact, I thought you were American when you were speaking. So <laughs> good for you. Um, but I have so many questions, um, as Derek knows. What is an Aya? As, a, as opposed to an Ajahn, what is an Aya? Um, Aya is just a title that is normally used in the um, uh, Pali Canon uh, as a term of um, through which bhikkhunis are referred to. So usually it's Aya Soma uh, is, I mean, Aya is just, um, yeah, Aya Damadina, like you see in the in the Damadina Sutta, for example, in the Majjhima Nikaya, it was just a term that was used. Uh, it, literally means venerable lady but it can actually aya can also be used um for males as well uh, so venerable man <laughs> and normally bant is what traditionally is used for males but actually apparently also bant has a gender neutral connotation so we tend to use Aya for female monks and um, Bante for male monks, but they can be interchanged. But at Empty Cloud Monastery, we're very traditional, <laughs> despite what some people think. <laughs> some people think we're a progressive monastery. I like to say that we are a regressive monastery. So we're so backwards, we're avant-garde. <laughs> um, so then we use Aya and Bante usually for could you speak about the writings that you've done? Um, I get lost in the, the in the Pali translations, and I'm trying to play catch up on a lot of things. But I did catch um, Derek saying that you have written some translations or written a book. And would you talk to yeah. us? About that? Thank you. Yeah. So the Pali Canon um, contains some of the oldest uh, teachings of the Buddha. Um, so that date from uh, reputedly back the time of the Buddha and uh, some of them are uh, the teachings of um, well the poems of the elder bhikkhunis so the elder enlightened uh, female monastics uh, of the time of the Buddha and it's actually an incredible treasure that we should I'll be very proud as Buddhists because I think it's actually like not the only religion, one of the very few religions that still contains so much material um, mm, uh, written, uh, well, not written, but shared. <laughs> now it's written, but <laughs> back then it was an oral tradition spoken by um, female practitioners. And so I just ventured into translating from Pali, which is uh, language related to Sanskrit, through which these teachings were preserved. And um, yeah, I translated the Tirigata, so the entire book um, that, that contains these poems uh, into both English and Italian. And we created actually a Terizin. I don't have it with me right now, but <laughs> um, you're welcome to write an email to info at emptycloud.org. Maybe I'll put it in the message and we can send you um, an, uh, a copy. And actually we'll send um, a whole box to Venerable Chanda. So if you're in the UK, that's a great way to, you know, go and offer her the meal, make merit, and then also get a <laughs> terizine <laughs> and some stickers back. But um, you can find the some of the translations on Sutta Central, not only mine, but also of uh, other monastics. Bhante Sujato has given, has made a translation um, as well as um, 
I think Tani Sarobiku has translated a few poems. There are a few translations here and there. The reason why I did it was because most translations are based on the commentaries and um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but I wanted to have a translation uh, that did not take into consideration what the commentaries that are significantly later um, ideas of people who weren't contemporary to the Buddha wrote about the texts. And so I thought to give it, to bring it out and then also make a translation in Italian since we don't have much in Italian. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. put suttacentral.net on the chat. Uh, you should all um, check out suttacentral.net. It's a great, amazing project that has so many translations of the Pali Canon offered for free. All right, any other questions, comments from friends? Marieke? I hope I'm pronouncing your name properly. <laughs> yes, good evening. Thank you, Aya. Um, I, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Uh, I understand very much your um, explanation, the difference um, between monastics and, and lay people. Uh, I appreciate um, that, that, um, th those differences. Um, my question is, obviously, lay people can't um, practice in the same way as monastics do. Um, they, they obviously don't have as much time for meditation. They have the distractions of everyday life. Um, so part of me is kind of thinking, what's the point? <laughs> I mean, I know there is a point. I know it for, for yourself, you, you, you practice and you, you, you know, I, 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 I always practice. I, I, I feel that need, but it's not going to be to the same extent. <laughs> I'm not quite sure if I'm phrasing it. Do you kind of understand what I mean? Yes, absolutely. And thank you for your question. Well, first of all, I would like to say that I would not be a monastic if I had not been a layperson beforehand. <laughs> and that, um, yeah, the Buddha was an incredible being on so many different levels. So actually, he has, um, well, created a system in which both monastics and lay people are symbiotic so they support each other and the practice there's basically no monastics without lay people and there's no lay people without monastics really <laughs> so a lot of forms of practice when we're converts uh, we tend to think it's just okay just meditation and doing um i don't know practicing the vinaya that's it and becomes this like very arbitrary, artificial sort of environment. Um, and actually, when you go to even monasteries that are only meditation oriented, um, the practice between monastics and lay people, it's actually identical. Um, it's kind of even pointless to be to be monastics <laughs> sometimes, to be quite frank, um, in the way, I mean, it has a point up to a certain extent, but the practice is very similar. Even on Goenka Center, you can see the same thing. Sometimes you will have monastics, everybody is following, you know, uh, the same um, meditation um, technique. And, um, you know, there is very little opportunities to break the precepts. <laughs> so there is, it doesn't really matter whether you have 311 precepts like I do or eight uh, or five even um, or zero, you know, you can't drink. There's no alcohol at a Goenka center. So even if you don't have the five precepts, you will still not break the five precepts. <laughs> well, maybe you might start killing people, but I still haven't heard of any. So, yeah, luckily, nobody has done that <laughs> so far. Um, so anyway, what I would say is that they're so the Buddha taught not the noble onefold path or twofold path or threefold path, but the noble eightfold path. So there are so many different things that we need to cultivate, both as monastics and lay people. And so it's a symbiotic relationship in which um, when we go to a traditional Buddhist monastery, we'll see how incredible and inspiring actually the lay people are, at least to me. Um, 
you know, my teachers are not only monastics, but are also a lot of uh, lay people. Asian lay people are incredibly inspiring to me. Uh, for example, all the things that I learned about even being a monastic come from them, like the episodes that I was telling you about. <laughs> Who taught me uh, to say Anuma ben Asad, not another monastic, but a lay person. And it was coming from their wisdom of understanding. It wasn't a custom. It wasn't like it's not written in a book. It's not uh, part of the Vinaya Pitika, you know, like it's a, a lay person understanding and teaching me through their wisdom um, why the appropriate response there is and not thank you. So that is our duty. It doesn't really matter our form, but it matters understanding the Dhamma, understanding, uh, having nurturing respect towards Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and nurturing respect towards the training, as we were saying earlier. So all of these things needs to be done in one shape and form. And then if we feel that at a certain point we have matured the conditions to take up monastic training, then great if we're lay people. Or if we're monastic and we feel that actually this uh, form is not supportive, then it's better to practice as lay people. The important thing is to practice. <laughs> then the form needs to aid the purpose. So I hope that answered your question. <laughs> and I think we're just about to run out of time, right? Derek, I think you had a few announcements. Well, I, my main announcement really is to thank you, Isoma, for this important expression of why we are trying to work so hard to make this Anukampa Bhikkhuni Monastery a coming to existence. And it's, it's really good to be reminded of the importance of the Bhikkhuni Sangha as practitioners who we can look up to and learn from. So thank you for that. I would also like to say that Isoma has very, very generously said that she would like to offer this talk purely for the benefit of the Anukampa community and the Anukampa project. So if anybody would like to support the project, then you can do so by visiting our website, it's www.anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. And also, we have been informed, or I have been informed in the last few days, that we have a Patreon account as well, which I was hardly aware of. So if you would like to donate via Patreon, which is a way to support us on YouTube, then you can do it. I put the link into the chat. And um, it's a small amount for each month to support the YouTube channel, which is also very generously received if you would like to do that. And I would finally like to offer you the chance to find out more about Ayasoma and about the Empty Cloud Monastery by visiting their website, which is emptycloud.org. And uh, Ayasoma is very generously going to come back in a few more times throughout the course of the year to give more talks and more teachings for us. So it will be great if uh, you would be able to join us for those talks as well. So thank you very much, Isoma. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And maybe we can end with three sadhus as it's traditional. So one, two, three. Sadhu. 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 May you be all well and happy and may all good things come to you. And I look forward to seeing you soon. <laughs>